Manitoulin Island, at the north end of Lake Huron and the Great Lakes, is the largest freshwater island in the world. The Bruce Peninsula is a finger of land pointing northwest toward Manitoulin Island from southern Ontario, dividing Lake Huron nearly in half. We begin at the western end of Manitoulin Island, near the Mississauga Lighthouse. Cracks in limestone get weathered open by thousands of years of waves and ice. In some of the deeper crevices, the sun doesn't reach in very far and ice stays long into June. Early lighthouse keepers kept their butter and perishable food in these natural ice boxes to stay cool. Northern white cedar trees have an interesting adaptation that allows them to grow in strange places. As long as the tree has one root in a decent crack or crevice, the tree can survive and grow. The trees at the top of the rocks here appear to be doing fairly well, despite living in a very exposed location in very inhospitable winter conditions. These plants live a precarious life. When the water in the lake is low, they get established in cracks and crevices. When the water rises, they get swept away. The Lafarge Quarry at the Mississauga Strait is one of the largest limestone quarries in the world. Most of the material is sold as dimension stone, not crushed, and shipped out by boat to the U.S. Misery Bay is on the southern shore of Manitoulin Island and is surrounded by Alvar landscapes and pavement barrens, savannas in Canadian terms. The eastern side of Misery Bay has more extensive tree growth. The character of the shoreline changes depending on the water level in Lake Huron. In the last 30 years, this shoreline has gone from being completely underwater to being a dry sandy beach to being a boulder-strewn marshy strand. The only thing constant about Great Lake shorelines is that they are constantly changing. The lines in the bedrock are the tracks of glaciers. These striae were scratched into the dolostone by loose rocks being dragged along on the underside of the massive ice sheet. The scratches show the glacier was moving southwest. Plants look funny growing in a straight line, but they are rooted in a crack in the bedrock to stay anchored and have moisture to grow. What causes pitting in the surface of these rocks? There are many answers. Clean rain is slightly acidic and limestone is slightly alkaline. Each raindrop causes a mini acid base reaction and starts to dissolve a small depression in which the water remains longer and longer, eventually forming a small pit. Dolostone, the type of limestone here, contains more magnesium than other types of limestone. The magnesium is slightly more soluble than other ions, which may cause some spots to weather more easily than others. Some of the pitting may be quite old, as one can look down into the water and see flat pitted limestone 10 feet down on rocks that have not been exposed above water or ice for thousands of years. Limestone or dolostone is exposed or close to the surface in this forest. The area has a history of fire and is still recovering from massive fires more than 300 years ago. Early land surveyors reported the area as extensively burned and they could see the lake from miles inland because there was no forest. The ground is covered with patches of reindeer lichens. These are not rooted, just anchored. They survive on moisture from rain and humidity. Cracks and holes in the bedrock are an important microhabitat, allowing trees to root. Deeper cracks go below the frost line and remain above freezing during the winter. These may also serve as a refuge for invertebrates. In winter, warm air rises out of these cracks, forming a hole or chimney in the snow. The wash of warm air allows some ferns to stay alive near the top of the crack. The lines of vegetation are the result of plants filling grooves and crevices in the bedrock, a legacy of the movement of glaciers. Small whitish green rosettes of weedy mullein, upper left corner of the white lichen, 
a Eurasian species not native to North America, testify that some type of human activity occurred here. The black layer at the bottom of the picture is actually a living crust made of dozens of lichens, algae, and bacteria. This is the very beginnings of soil formation, a very slow process. A mix of poverty grass, reindeer lichens, and bearberry somehow manages to retain enough moisture and nutrients for all the species to grow in very shallow soil on top of bedrock. A wealth of tiny species covers the rock, lichens, mosses, liverworts, annual grasses, and other small flowering plants. This is the very beginning of soil formation, a very slow process where there is no mineral soil and little organic matter. Here you see tiny species creeping out over the rock. Alvar vegetation can fill in from the outward expansion around trees and shrubs. When a tree gets established, it drops leaves or needles on the rock and organic material starts to build up. As material accumulates, other species may root in it as the grasses have done under these trees at the edge of the trail. Further east on Manitoulin Island, we explore Michaels Bay. Study this next overhead for a moment, where you will see nearly 50 remnant shorelines. This shoreline was recently reclaimed by Judith Jones and crew after having been completely overgrown with invasive Phragmites, a tall foreign grass that quickly takes over wet areas, probably brought in by four-wheelers. The narrow sandy beach was newly formed in 2018-19 after the invasive grass was removed over three years of work. Inland from the sand beach and current shoreline at Michaels Bay, there is a repeating series of narrow fens and small dry sandy ridges. These ridges are remnants of former shorelines left behind as lake levels decreased, and the shoreline receded over the last 11,000 years after the glaciers melted. The relatively young trees of mostly uniform height on these ridges may reflect fire or logging in the last century. You see eastern white pine, northern white cedar, balsam fir, black spruce, paper birch, and aspen on the sandy ridges. We fly over more than a dozen older shorelines, which continue another mile into the distance, totaling perhaps 50 or more distinct ridges of former shorelines. The ridges are from a half a meter to as much as three meters in height and are relatively dry sandy soils formed from coarse sands deposited over hundreds of years from limestone and dolomite pavement outcrops around Michaels Bay. The narrow fens between the ridges are extremely species rich, filled with orchids, carnivorous plants like sundews and pitcher plants, and a great diversity of sedges. Other species include sphagnum moss, buckbean, beak rush, St. John's wort, and rose pagonia, in addition to shrubs like leatherleaf, bog rosemary, sweet gale, and large and small cranberry. Looking out to the mouth of Michaels Bay, we see this shoreline is protected from storms from nearly all directions except southwest. Looking down on seven or eight older shorelines closest to the beach, we can see some of the rich plant diversity in the fens and more detail on the ridges. While each ridge of trees looks like it may be one older shoreline, a closer look reveals many of these ridges may have additional older shorelines or old storm beaches within them. The drone gives us a clear view of the fens and ridges as we fly toward the beach. Variations in ridge width and shape help us see that storm beaches and multiple shorelines are what shape these ridges and fens. Some of the fens are quite flooded. We see many former shorelines with small trees as we get closer to the bay. As we approach the beach, you will see dry grassy openings along the edge of the trees just inland of the quad trail that contain hill's thistle, a threatened species found in prairies, alvars, and dunes. It is this quad trail that brings invasive species onto the beach. Thirty years ago, this shoreline had low sandy dunes, 
but in nature, things are always changing, especially on Great Lakes shores. We moved to the east end of Manitoulin Island, to the ferry port at South Baymouth. Small spruce and cedar trees are living here, in a harsh reality exposed to the cold winds and spray of Lake Huron. These trees are also stressed because they provide winter habitat for a large population of white-tailed deer, who eat the needles off the lower branches. In spite of the extremes of wind, ice, and light intensity, a huge diversity of species thrive on these rocks, including some beautiful wildflowers like dwarf lake iris, ram's head orchid, and yellow lady slipper, as well as less obvious species like Richardson's sedge. We see very large glacial grooves here on these rocks. These are gentle undulations in the bedrock carved by glacial ice scouring from northeast to southwest. The larger grooves are about two meters across. Lake levels rise and fall over approximately 30-year cycles. In some years, these rocks are an island and the marsh is underwater. In other years, the ground behind the rocks is completely dry. Plants living at the water's edge live a precarious existence. They find good habitat on open rock, but they may get wiped out by the very factors that keep their habitat suitable. Small holes in the rock provide microhabitat for algae and other species. After a time, some organic matter builds up in them, allowing other species, like these small trees, to get established. A meadow marsh is a natural grassland, full of native sedges and other North American plants. We move south off of Manitoulin Island to the Bruce Peninsula, which divides Lake Huron from Georgian Bay. Behind Singing Sands Beach on Dorcas Bay is a rich shoreline fen ecosystems, sometimes called coastal meadow marsh, and listed as a rare type of vegetation in Ontario. Filmed in fall, this fen is preparing for a harsh fall and winter and does not show the lush sedges, grasses, and pitcher plants it is known for in spring and summer. Shorelines are always changing, tied to changing lake levels, the activity of wildlife like beavers, the action of humans and other factors. Here, dead trees attest to changes in water levels in the marsh. Years of flooding may have killed the trees, and this probably benefited the sedges and other plants that grow in the open sun. Nature is dynamic, and there is always a balance and trade-off. Trees may start to fill in the fen, but when flooding returns, they may die back again. This is an extremely species-rich fen due to the influence of groundwater and accumulated organic matter. But it is not a nutrient-rich environment, so some plants have adapted to digest insects to supplement their nitrogen needs. Examples are the reddish pitcher plants in the foreground and the tiny sundews found right down on the surface of the peat. The drone allows us to travel into the fen without trampling the plants and their fragile peat substrate. We now move across the Bruce Peninsula to the Georgian Bayside, to Little Cove. These cobbles are formed of broken limestone that has been tumbled and rounded for thousands of years. The tumbling continues today from waves and ice movement. This limestone, formed millions of years ago, is from an ancient marine environment full of coral and tiny shelled animals. The fossils of these creatures are still with us today in these rocks. The water looks inviting for a swim, but even in midsummer, the water is very cold. The Great Lakes are too large to heat up significantly. The best swimming in Lake Huron is in early September. Here is a very rare look at a large conchoidal fracture. The material could be obsidian, a form of glass. Stone Age man made tools and spears from this type of rock and traveled long distances to find a source. Cultures that had obsidian were able to trade with cultures that did not have it, 
often hundreds, even thousands of miles away. We end this film where we began, at Manitoulin Island's Mississauga Lighthouse.